Okay. Welcome everybody to the December 6th, 2023 City of Santa Rosa Cultural Heritage Board uh, meeting. Um, hope everybody's had a good holiday. <laughs> and um, we'll go ahead and uh, and get started. So, uh, Ms. Buckhide, if we could have a roll call. Uh, board member Boren is absent. Uh, board member Carney is currently absent, but will be showing up later. Uh, board member Fennell. Mm -hmm. uh, board member Klein is absent. Board member Mar Marslin. Here. Vice Chair Garrett. Here. Chair Muser. Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of board member Boren, board member Klein, um, and board member Carney, who will be showing up later. Okay, moving on to item two, approval of the minutes. Does anybody have any additions? We have the September 13th minutes and the September 20th minutes. So any additions, corrections to those minutes? Okay, then we'll let those minutes stand. And I'll Item three, public comments. This is the time when any person may address matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction. The public may comment. Wait one sec, Brian. <laughs> That's me, go. <laughs> the public may comment on agenda items when the item is called. Uh, each speaker is allowed three minutes. And not seeing any members of the public, I'll uh, close the public comment. Yes, right. and just a reminder to those viewing on Zoom, we are only accepting public comment in person. Okay, moving to item four, board business. I'll read our statement of purpose. The principal duties of the board include undertaking and updating historic inventories or surveys, recommending designation of landmarks and preservation districts, reviewing proposed alterations to historic buildings, and promoting public awareness of preservation issues. If you are in a historic district and would like more information regarding historic districts, please see the processing review procedures for owners of historic properties. Item 4.2, a board member reports. So, Ms. Fennell. <laughs> no. Any, any board member reports? No, no, no. Okay. I'll close then item 4.2. Item 4.3, other, we don't have any other items. And item five, department reports. Ms. Murray, give us a nice long department <laughs> report. <laughs> well, let's see. Oh, I don't, I, I don't have much of a report. Uh, I will say that we have another um, Cultural Heritage Board meeting next Wednesday, which is an off date. It's a special meeting. Um, I will not be here. I'm going to see Chris Isaac that night. And Kristen A. Tumians will be substituting a staff liaison. Um, I, the product or the item coming before you is a single family residence. Uh, located in the McDonald district. So I encourage everybody to look at the plans in advance and um, yeah, come prepared for um, uh, a nice project. This is the project that we previously saw mm -hmm. under so a concept review. Some members of the board have seen this <laughs> on a concept basis. Okay. Um, it would be a good idea, I think, for everybody to watch that meeting and just refresh and certainly for those who who weren't present at it, um, and I'd be happy to send you a link. Thank I'll you. send. I'll send all the new your members. I'll send the board a link. That looks like they really improved the landscaping. I said so you looked at the the project already. I uh, know. I bet I saw the um, they, you know the, the board sign. I think uh, the the agenda. The reason it hasn't published is my fault, and it's going to be published tomorrow by our amazing Lonnie. <laughs> no, that's why it doesn't show the You won't see it yet. Yeah. It you will, but it'll, it only, you look for your emails that, that Lonnie sent up. 
they're not kind of, you know, so we need to get that fixed. So um, Lonnie sends out an email to the board. Mm -hmm. She's or staff sends emails to the board. They don't only come from Lonnie for uh, quarry quarry checks and to let you know when there's an agenda to review. And it's real handy. You can always, you know, I always check every Friday. Yeah. Just because, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not getting emails. Not since um, October or November. Okay. Well, well, give me a call tomorrow, and we will get that fixed. She probably emailed me to tell me that my new iPad was in, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> give her a call. I'll give her a call. Okay, and I think that that's it for for board or for uh, department reports. Okay, <clears throat> close item five. Um, statement of abstentions. We really don't have anything to recuse ourselves from today, so we'll close that item. Uh, item seven, consent items. We have none. <laughs> that brings us to today's scheduled item 8.1, and we're going to just take a short uh, recess until uh, board member Carney arrives shortly, and then we'll restart again.
need to watch the. Uh, we don't want to be here all night. Oh, uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Can you do that? Yep. I, I can. I just hit fumble. And I do want to, you know, take a minute to introduce uh, Crystal, Crystal Camp, yeah. who is uh, in training right now and yeah. will possibly be our recording secretary <laughs> Great. time in the future. So welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you folks. Okay, moving on then to item uh, item 8.1, which is a, uh, a workshop. And as I as I promised the board before, we'll try to keep this, I think we can probably keep it within an hour and a half of the workshop. Um, so the purpose uh, of this presentation that I'm going to make uh, is to bring awareness and understanding of the process and the costs related to residential. And we're just gonna stick with residential, okay, uh, landmark alteration permits. Uh, this presentation will take us through a process of getting a major landmark alteration permit, uh, which uh, Vice Chair uh, Garrett actually um, signed uh, the resolution to in the past. Um, of uh, it involved repairing and remodeling a front porch. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to discuss ideas uh, that you may have for changes that may make uh, major landmark alteration processes easier for homeowners in an effort to achieve greater compliance. And um, just remember this item was actually began with a concern that board member Fennell had uh, uh, back in, uh, uh, what was it, uh, August or June of uh, 23, that there was a lot of landmark alterations being done in historic districts without the benefit of getting permits. So it's been, a, this is kind of a continuation of that. Um, I ask that all board members hold their questions and comments till the end of the presentation. Uh, at that time, the board's um, uh, uh, discussion may include clarifying questions to the staff as well as ideas to improve general awareness and promote historic preservation. Um, the continuation or conclusion of this study session will really be the only motion, it'll be the only possible motion or action that we'll take today. Uh, we're not gonna be taking any other kind of action or recommendation. This is just basically a study session to give you some background. Um, but I will ask um, at the end um, for uh, a motion to either continue the, this item or to conclude it um, one or the other if, if depending on which way the board wants, wants to go. So with that, and um, with Ms. Murray also, I've, tr I've tried, I've worked with her on the PowerPoint, I've tried to be as accurate as possible, but if there is some inaccuracies, maybe at the end of the presentation, you can bring up our inaccuracies <laughs> or, or clarifications of, of anything if I get something a little wrong. That way we can just get through the presentation and get, get into the actual discussion period. Okay. All right. Anyway. Okay. So this this was the um, um, the front porch uh, that the owner uh, decided that it had been remodeled, as as we'll call it. That's not original. It had been done like that and they decided they wanted to restore it back to its um, as close as they could to its original design. 
Um, so in doing that, um, there's a process that uh, this owner uh, went through and we're gonna kind of go through that process. So the, um, the first thing that um, they did was a concept review. And um, actually before the uh, consultation with cultural heritage, that should probably say consultation with cultural heritage board staff uh, mm -hmm. for concept review, because um, they're kind of the first uh, place that they come to with their ideas and their thoughts. And, um, and I'm thinking it's pretty much Miss Murray that they meet with on that initial Group. No, they'll meet with planning staff, oh, whoever's, different planning staff. whoever's okay. on the counter and okay. get that direction. Um, and um, so if it's a major item, a lot of times staff will ask them to have a neighborhood meeting. Um, I don't know that that happens a lot with residential, you know, or, or an item uh, this small, just a, uh, but it, it is oftentimes recommended <laughs> that they talk to their neighbors and have a neighborhood hood meeting. Um, they uh, have to fill out a universal planning application and associated forms. Um, and I have made some copies for. So this is the, um, the zoning code for uh, concept review. And you know, we're not gonna review these or you don't have to get into them at this. This is kind of just take home stuff. <laughs> and then this is a concept review um, application kind of checklist. We're all included as attachments to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brian, why don't you go ahead with your presentation and I'll go ahead and hand those out. Okay. And got oh my stuff out of order here. Was there another one of those? You, did, you, did you get one more? Uh, yeah. Huh. All right. Can I have one? <clears throat> yeah, there's one of mine. Yeah. Turn it. Sure. Oh. Well, I, don't I, know. <laughs> I know it is. I have it on my computer. Do you want me to hand out the rest of these now, or no? No. Okay. No, I've got a kind of a. Stage Tell me when you plan. when yeah. you want me to. So um, you can see the concept review um, kind of checklist. The items that uh, you know somebody that wants to do a concept <laughs> review uh, needs to be prepared to provide. Okay. And, um, but one thing that I'll stress, and, and you can go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong right now on this, when it comes to the narrative, when it comes to a concept, a lot of it can be generated by them. They can do their own kind of drawings, their own pictures, their own, without actually getting into hiring an architect at, at this point or, or to, you know, spend that kind of, or get a historical analysis or anything like that. It's, it, but they do have to fill out um, an application. They do have to fill out uh, paperwork because the city needs a way to be able to track the project and put the project into the system. Um, there you go. The universal uh, planning application and, and its associated forms is what they would get also at this time. And then for concept review, there's also the city has, has a requirement for uh, public notice. So there is a cost to the city for sending out public notice. And there is a minor cost to the homeowner because they also have have to post on their property for the concept review. So this is just a quick copy from a page of the uh, the current fee schedule. 
Um, I think it's current, <laughs> but I think I think uh, Miss Murray made some updates to it. it. It changed since the the first time that I. But you can see uh, concept review is no charge. A minor landmark alteration permit. Actually, that's it's different now. It's five hundred and fifty five dollars, I think. And the major, I think that dollar amount might be correct. One thousand forty one. Um, so that's for if the homeowner is uh, the applicant. And that's something else I want to, the reason I kind of brought this up is it's broken down into homeowner's applicant versus non-homeowner. And so probably later on in, in, in our next meeting and discussion, that's probably something I'm going to bring up is that those definitions. I'm wondering how well those definitions really apply, a homeowner versus versus maybe residential versus commercial or some, some other form of defining. But anyway, so, um, so really with concept review, you're looking at no charge for concept review. Uh, there's no charge for public hearing for coming before the Cultural Heritage Board with concept review. And it's probably like a nominal $50 cost for um, doing the public uh, uh, sign of uh, public notice sign in, on your property. No, that's what it's more much. It's mm -hmm. that's way more expensive. It's like four hundred. Yeah. Well, for concept, it's cheaper though, right? Did well, we? You know, so it depends on is, the size is it a of full the property. Size? It depends on the size. No, it's so it depends on the size of the property. And most residential lots will only require a six or a twelve foot uh, square foot sign, mm -hmm. and those can be printed at Kinko's and posted. So it can no, be it low or it does not have to be, no, it doesn't have to be done by a, and, a sign and, company. And because Everything. you're going to have to do a more formal one for a landmark, it's best to do as cheap as possible one Absolutely. for concept. Yeah. Cheap. Okay. So that moves us then on to. Okay. So. The applicant has gone through concept review, has gotten feedback from Cultural Heritage Board staff, has gotten feedback from the Cultural Heritage Board themselves on the concept, and now they've come back for applying for a major landmark alteration permit. Okay, so, and, and you got handed out, I believe, a major landmark alteration checklist there. Okay. So this is a checklist that um, staff and the applicant can go down um, and and check off what's going to be required to um, uh, apply for a major landmark alteration. Okay, so now we get into the cost. We'll look at the cost again. So we had our other, our our first sign. $50, we've got now a major landmark alteration permit of $1,041 for uh, owner occupied. And we have a public hearing uh, fee of $555. And now you gotta make the nice big fancy sign. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a, just a single facing a lot, it's just one sign. If you're on a corner lot, you get to make two signs. So I actually called the sign companies and this was the average that I got for, and that's though includes them coming out and placing the sign for, for you um, in, in that cost. Did you give them a meaning or uh, sign size? Um, they had, when I called, they knew what the city sign size was required. I just asked them for, you know, the sign companies are on board with right. that. Okay. Okay, so application documents, um, you know, as well as the application, everything that's been submitted, now that they're gonna need to provide color photographs of the site. I'm gonna just kind of go through this quickly. They need to do a narrative um, of what the project is. And in most cases, what we've seen, especially if it's an involved restoration of a residence, Usually uh, an architectural history service of one form or another is hired to perform that. And it's, it's, 
it's usually to, um, in this case, was to properly document what was there originally and that what they were putting back was going back to what was there uh, originally. The, um, it isn't required that you hire a professional to do it. The homeowner can actually do this task. And actually in the old language with the Cultural Heritage Board, um, the Cultural Heritage Board themselves could do, can do this task. But um, at, at some point, the board needs to hear um, some kind of a historical concept perspective uh, narrative of, of what was there, what's existing, and what's going to change. Um, neighborhood context map. And that's pretty easy. It's just basically, you know, this is where this particular um, house sits on Pine Street. Project evaluation. Now the project valuation is, is tough because if you're gonna go over $200,000, then you're gonna to have to also do um, upgrade any uh, uh, improvements uh, such as you know sidewalks or wheelchair ramps or street lights, um, um, basically anything. And, and a lot of our old neighborhoods um, have a lot of that stuff that needs to be, and it's pretty easy to get up to $200,000. I didn't put it in this program, but I did notice that this particular example we're using, they have a new sidewalk in front, and I have a feeling they hit the $200,000 mark and were probably required to replace their sidewalk in front as well. But I, I didn't put any of those costs in this program. Did it need replacing? Hmm? Did it need replacing? Pretty much all the sidewalks in oh, yeah, our neighborhood need to be uh, okay. I, The only ones that don't need to be replaced have been recently replaced. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so then there's the stormwater worksheet. We won't spend any time really with that, but it's another requirement that has to be completed. Uh, of course, architectural detail plan sheet. So with concept, they really could have come in with just hand-drawn drawings of, of what the, the new front porch was going to look at. But when you get to a major landmark, now we, we want to see, um, you know, drawings. And really, the cost of this, if it's approved, is just gets absorbed into the building permit fees because they need these drawings for the building permit anyway. The only time this cost is really lost is if it doesn't get approved and then they can't get a building permit and then they just spent that money for, for those fees. Um, existing and proposed elevations and materials and color detail sheet. Uh, color is probably um, not really required, but we always do like to see what what colors that they're going to do, but we can't really rule on on the colors. Um, but we like to see like things like light fixtures, windows, um, designs, and, and, and that type of stuff. And again, these are things that the homeowner, if they're aware, and they go through concept review, can probably put that sheet together themselves without having to hire a professional. Uh, site plan. Okay, so those are the kind of the major elements as well as what you saw in the landmark alteration checklist uh, sheet. So now we get, kind of get the cost goes up again a little bit. Uh, so now we get historical <laughs> resource evaluation. Oh, you're lucky if it's only a thousand dollars. I'm I'm being cheap. Yeah, you are being really cheap. It was only a porch. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, but the whole house has to be evaluated. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah. I'm being cheap, but it still gets expensive. The architectural fees and the site plan and elevations, $2,000. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really cheap. <laughs> okay, and then um, the time, for, the date of application for this project was uh, 9-25-2020. The date of approval uh, of the resolution was 4-21. Twenty twenty one, so seven months, which is probably pretty typical right now, I think, for major landmark alterations. But I will say 
this project is when we were really having trouble getting quorums and it got bumped, I think, two times um, because we didn't have quorums. And so that prolonged, it, it could have been probably closer to six months rather than, than seven months. That's, that's the importance that's of everybody showing up. And that's what it took during COVID. And I had a really good planner <laughs> for my project, which is non-conforming for a historic district. And it took six months. Yeah, yeah. Our, our uh, time frames that are quoted Mm -hmm. say six months for yeah. a major yeah. landmark alteration. That makes it, well, we're not we'll get there. <laughs> so, um, okay. So Colts Heritage Board, uh, public hearing review process. Um, so I'm not sure if ever, if have, have you got to see a, a major landmark alteration process yet? Have we? Since you guys have been board members, have we had a major landmark alteration? I don't think. I mean, we had the street. we had the. That's not major. That's that was not. A concept. That was a yeah. concept. Yeah, we haven't got there on that one yet. Yeah. So, so basically, the process is the the staff makes presentation. <clears throat> the applicant uh, has the opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, oftentimes, there's an architect. There's a licensed historical planner that is either in the audience or oftentimes makes the presentation as well. Uh, there's a public comment period, there's board discussion, conditioning, and then action, and then res resolution approval or denial. And th this particular project was approved, um, signed by uh, Vice Chair Karen. <laughs> and um, so this kind of gets us into, you know, as board members, so, you know, how, how are we going to, how do we determine whether this should be approved or or denied, and um, so some of the documents and the criteria that we use are uh, number one the processing review procedures for owners of historic properties. That's a guide for us, and it should also be a guide for the applicant. The general plan. So the gen the general plan basically. Um, a general plan sets goals regard to historic preservation and the role of the cultural heritage board. The zoning code implements those goals and objectives of the general plan through zoning and development standards within the historic districts known as H overlay. So you'll, you'll hear that every area, every property has a general zoning, but when it's in a historic neighborhood, it has an H overlay. And that H overlay then adds additional uh, uh, zoning uh, standards. Um, I'll just jump through this real quick. You're probably all aware, if you don't have a copy of this, you should have a hard copy uh, of this document. Processing review procedure for owners for historic properties. I will say it's ready for an update. It's pretty darn good, but it, it does, it's been a while. One thing uh, I would recommend that when it goes into it would be if there's associated costs. It's, the cost situation shouldn't be a surprise at the end. It should be known right, right up front if that's possible application costs up. The general plan. So we're in the process of getting a new general plan. Um, the There is a section of the general plan for um, historic preservation and, and we uh, should be aware of that because again that's what sets the goals. Uh, the zoning codes and we, there's a lot of zoning <laughs> code sections. Um, but um, the zoning code sections, you know, identify um, the um, uh, design guidelines for um, combining districts. And when I say combining district, that means 
a district that has a regular zoning designation and an H overlay. They call that a combining district. So we should be aware of, of the zoning codes. Um, design guidelines. There's another document that um, the city has that is design guidelines for historic properties and, and districts. And uh, there's some more zoning code uh, information. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing these things up is when we make decisions, we need to make decisions based on principles and that have been established, you know, uh, by the city um, rather than maybe our own personal opinions. Okay. And, um, and that's, that's why it's tough because we come onto the board as just general representatives of the public and we may or may not have background in this. So we've got to take the time as a board to educate ourselves and have this information available and do our research so that when we do look at a project, we do give the applicant due justice and uh, making our determinations. So in this project, the city uh, planner that was in charge, um, these were some of the historic analysis observations um, that they came up with. And we would be, as, as a board member, we would be looking at these items and we would basically be either agreeing or disagreeing with them. If we agree with them, them, that's great. If we disagree with them, if you have enough disagreements, that could lead you to not want to approve the project. But your disagreement should be based on, on principles and not just based on, well, I really don't like the way that looks. You know, and there shouldn't be opinion at all. There shouldn't be. There always, <laughs> if there was an opinion, we could have an AI just do the job. So, uh, so there's it. Okay. Um, CEQA generally residential projects, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can speak, Susie, but residential projects usually are in compliance with CEQA. They, they don't have enough of an impact. To, but if we get into um, major landmark alterations for commercial, then CEQA really can play, play a role. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is in that last uh, measure, 15331, we are not qualified experts, staff, meaning we as in staff. And so we, and it's that finding that, or that, um, that statement, <laughs> that, that's that statement though, and this is not, yeah, this is not a finding or a review criteria. This is CEQA, but in order to, to find it in compliance with CEQA based on this, find, this, this section of CEQA, um, we need to have that report. Yeah. Okay. Some smaller projects we we through the process have learned and become comfortable making that determination. But um, if it's a if, you know if it's a new home or a significant remodel on a single family residential, that's when that's going to trigger the report. Yeah. Okay. So generally, if we have a project, oops, let me go back. If we have a project coming before us. Um, and the, uh, the staff uh, planner um, is generally, if it's coming before us, is going to recommend for approval, okay? Um, and they're gonna recommend for approval based on um, the review criteria that was established. And the review criteria came from the applicant, came from the historian, came from, you know, various sources that are going to be presented to you and then as board members it's our responsibility then to take that information and lay that over what we know zoning code says what we know secretary of the interior says what we you know what we know on those things and say does it align or is it are they or does it not align um 
And I'll just give a quick example. Um, commercial wise, um, we're probably going to see projects that are going to want to go more than 35 feet. Well, our standards and most historic say 35 feet. So there's going to be reason, justification, um, review criteria to justify why it could go over. And it's going to be up to us to then determine whether um, a Caritas Village, this is an example of that, you know. So anyway. Okay, so then the final um, ending thing will be um, someone on the board will make a motion to approve the resolution. And as board members, we should have read that resolution very carefully prior to the meeting because that resolution has the review criteria written into it. And if it's missing that review criteria, if it got left out, then that's something. Or if you disagree with the review criteria, these are the things that are going to lead you to either voting for the resolution or denying the, the, the resolution. Okay, so completed project. That's what it looked like before. That's what it looked like afterwards. Did you approve that break? No. <laughs> no, no that was not. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. So very nicely done. It's it's uh, just a tribute. Uh, the the copper rain chains um, that they did. It's just yeah. It's if you saw that building before and after, it's it's a real real benefit. Um, Okay, so what elements culture guide to decision approval? Again, review criteria, and I think I've, I've beat that bush enough, um, but these are just, you know, um, areas of, of Secretary of the Interiors. Probably the biggest challenge we will have as a board with the Secretary of the Interiors is when the Secretary of the Interiors suggests that an addition should be of a dissimilar material so that it denotes itself differently from the main structure. And there's a lot of people who do an addition of the house. They don't want their addition to look different. They want to use the same siding and the same. But anyway, but we'll we'll cross those bridges with as, as they come. OK, so in the end, um, major landmark alteration costs um, for this, and this is probably light, to be honest with you, is $5,046. Now, remember, they still haven't got a permit yet. They still haven't got the permit costs and those things. This is just for, so if this project is denied, other than the site plan and those things that may be used for permit, but that's, that could be just, you know, a, a, a wash. So this this is just for major landmark alteration for residential. Okay, general plan says consider removing or simplifying obstacles for owners of historic properties to support preservation, including guidelines for repurposing facilities and concurrent review of entitlement and building permit applications. This is out of the draft general plan. Okay, and so I'm kind of running with this to our board, basically saying, okay, knowing what we know and getting a landmark alteration, are there changes we can make that would be in alignment with this goal from the general plan? So some potential changes that I've thought of, and this is just me personally, is eliminate major and minor landmark alteration fee for residential landmarks in historic neighborhoods and eliminate the fee associated when appearing before the Cultural Heritage Board. So that's about $1,600 uh, in fees that um, it could save the applicant. Update the processing review procedures for owners of historic properties. Uh, give greater emphasis and perhaps make concept review a requirement. I'll tell you, a concept review, when you get into this, that's where um, that's where you can really save the people 
money. If they come to the Cultural Heritage Board with a crazy plan after they've gone through the landmark alteration permit process and all those costs and then we can't approve it, it would have been so much better if they would have come at concept review and we could have given them the bad news at concept review before they spent that money. Um, give the Cultural Heritage Board authority to determine if the project should be permitted based on the direction given at concept review. So uh, Ms. Murray has talked about this at concept review, if there's a way that um, we can turn the project over to maybe the zoning administrator with our comments, and if they're willing to do what our comments were at concept review to move forward with the project. Allow cultural heritage board members to determine based on project scope, the need for, and the type of historic documentation that should accompany the major landmark alteration. So if they don't really need a historic review, you know, and have to pay that cost one to two thousand dollars. Let's let's tell them that concept review that they don't need to have that. That's if they'll do their own research, you know, come to us with their own. If it's a big project or something or or significant building, we might want that, but allow that. Um, okay. How we can make the process easier, reduce costs to homeowners, uh, promote greater communication between historic neighborhoods, property owners, and cultural heritage board, and utilize funding resources like community advisory board grants to promote historic preservation. Um, I go to a board chair's um, mayor's lunch um, like every other month and talk to the community advisory board chair and he said there is grant money available that if we came up with a plan to try to promote historic preservation or or and, and i know board member fennel uh, was talking a lot about really trying to get the information out there personally from talking to my neighbors and things i think <laughs> i think they know what's involved and i think that's <laughs> That's why they're doing it on Sunday, because they they know they've been told how expensive it's going to be and how long it's going to take and it may get denied. But anyway, and that's it. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Miss Murray and let her um, if she has comments or clarifications. Or if you have also questions for for Ms. Murray. So I do. I have some just some follow-up notes I took during the meeting. Um, I want to say uh, first that the the neighborhood meeting is required for all landmark for um, entitlements. The so landmark alteration is an entitlement that require a public hearing. A major landmark alteration requires a public hear hearing. Therefore, it does require. A neighborhood meeting. So the neighborhood meeting signs um, range from six feet, six square feet to 32 square feet. 32 square feet is on a property that is an acre. Um, six square feet is on a property that's 6,000 square feet or less. And, and it kind of ranges. So it's 6, 12, 24, 32. Um, and those signs vary in cost, but the beauty of that little six foot square or square foot sign, there's nothing that says that it has to be a sign company and that tax on a few hundred extra dollars or more, depending on the size of the sign. But generally speaking, I think the lots probably fall between that six and 20,000. So it's gonna be a 24 square foot sign. Um, they do, as the code is written now, they require that, that sign for concept review and for, um, and for their hearing. If it's a major, right, they, they have to have both of those. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, that I can, you know, I could get creative and say I can use the same sign for my project description is not changing and just do a, a face over on it. Just hold on to your sign. You know, I don't know. So the very, the price can range from $50 if you're creative up to probably several hundred dollars, probably more than what Brian was talking or Jeremy. Yeah, the, the $400 was the, yeah. what they quoted for the landmark. Yeah, alteration. Yeah. Sorry. Um, concept plans, yes, they can come in and so long as we at staff level can understand what they're proposing, 
that we can use those plans to come to the board. We do, we do make sure that there is, um, you can, you can tell what they're doing. We've seen, we've seen plans come in on scratch paper and, you know, we try to, uh, we kind of require those to be gussied up a little bit. So, if, you know, it's kind of like you, you get out what you put in. If you can't give something what you want to do, I mean, I guess there's, you know, somebody could say, I'm just wanting to do an update to my home. Can I talk to the board? They don't even have to go on a, a, a um, go through staff for that. They can come and if they can do it quick enough, they can do it in three minutes. This is what I want to do. And I'm looking for your guidance. Um, they don't need to be agendized for that. That's a, a board response. Whether if it triggers a discussion, we would probably put it on an agenda at a later date, a long discussion. Um, so that's that on that. I wanted to follow up. I did look at the conditions of approval for the sidewalk. It was a recommendation. It was in the conditions. It was recommended by staff, but it is, was not required. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> Yay. Boy, you're so, fast. So, <laughs> So um, it's, well, I'm not. I, the reason I knew to look is because I know that that 200,000 triggers, it's a big trigger. It can trigger a lot of things, but it also has, we also have to have the nexus. We also, you know, requiring a street light or something like that, those things get very expensive. So there, there are some limitations on what improvements, public improvements can be required. Um, and our engineering staff, they're, they're, they're a group of reasonable people, usually. <laughs> so um, they, they didn't require sidewalks on my project. Yeah. So and I'm guessing you went over 200 and your shingles alone. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, yeah. Um, the, I wanted to point out that the memo that was sent to the board um, for this meeting included links mm -hmm. to Secretary of the Interior Standards, the two zoning code sections that apply for the H combining district. In the H combining district, every uh, preservation district is broken out with, um, you know, the, the features that the, the, the character defining features that the district is known for, the years, the years of um, What's the word I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. Of historical significance. Yeah, thank you. The period of significance for that that uh, particular preservation district. So there's there's really a lot of good information in that age combining district that can help guide um, your direction. Because again, it's not your opinion. That's not. I've said it before, and we all have opinions. I've had to recommend approval on projects that I did not like at all. Not necessarily in preservation districts, but that that's happened. And it's when when you can make the in this case the um, go through the review criteria. If you have something that's kind of iffy, um, it doesn't mean you can't recommend approval. It just means that that feeds your decision. That 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 guides your decision as a board. You come to a decision. You don't have to come to a consensus. Uh, um, yeah. A quorum, um, four people. If you have four people, a simple quorum, three people need to be able to um, come to one decision in order to make it pass or fail. Um, and then, oh, so uh, Chair Muser was talking about the the um, historic report, and I'll say, you know, when we were talking about the CEQA measures. They only need one measure to be found in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Most homes are small structures. It's a minor change to an existing structure. We never have to even mention that measure that talks about the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So if you have said, okay, if you want to do that, that facade change on the front, use this type of siding, these types of windows, and you know, these are our recommendations, we don't have to get that that report. That is an expense, and um, we just had the same discussion with staff today. Those technical studies get super expensive. If we don't need them, let's not ask for them. So, I think uh, we're we're all supporting that for the small projects. So, and that's really. Oh wait, wait. I, reduced review authority. We have a process right now in our zoning code. It's the reduced review authority, and it was a way to get. 
development moving in our priority development areas. Those are the areas that are along our arterial streets. College Avenue, Santa Rosa Avenue, um, uh, Stony Point, well, not Stony Point, uh, Dutton Meadow. So they're kind of all over the city. And those priority development areas, well, there's a lot of housing going up. And the process that's been used for that is they've gone to concept, a required concept design review before the design review board with plans that were not done, but really gave a good idea of what was going to happen. The design review board weighs in with their comments, okay? And then they go to the, the zoning administrator. Now, if they don't, if they don't implement all the design review board's comments, it doesn't mean they don't get approved. It means those comments and those responses are considered by the zoning administrator and the zoning administrator makes the decision to approve or deny. Um, the zoning administrator, I've sat in that, that position, I've done that for those large projects. And um, I, you know, I, I, I depend very much so on the design review board and we have a process where one member of the design review board attends those meetings to help guide the, the zoning administrator when she or he is not feeling so confident, right? I'm not an architect. So um, a similar process yeah. is, yeah, what, what term user, yeah, yeah. What we could do here for um, homeowners of uh, single family or duet units, smaller, mm -hmm. you know, maybe define it by the area like we do with design review at 10,000 square feet. So yeah. those are some suggestions. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the city's perspective. You can answer from the applicant's perspective, <laughs> being one. So. I guess my question would be if I'm <clears throat> a new homeowner and I want to do something minor like the porch you're talking about, if I walk into the city, um, the staff there is going to tell me what my options are. Like I could go to the go to heritage board and present what I'd like to do without paying any money or doing anything. I could start there. That's an option, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they let they let the folks that come in know that, so mm -hmm. people are educated about what their options are. Absolutely. If they have any doubt at the counter, they'll get a planner involved. We have a planner on duty every day, and we have several planners in the building. And uh, when we're not in the building, we're usually available by teams. So nice. Yeah. I I wish, and I, I know it's not going to be possible, but the universal planning application form. I wish for concept review, we had just a really simple form um, with a simple checklist, mm -hmm. rather than having to fill out or go through that universal. That would that turn that'll turn you away from the counter right there when you mm -hmm. when you see that that document that and all the information because it's designed to do everything and with concept review hopefully they're sitting down with a good um, uh, counter tech or planner that realizes you know you only need to check this box and this box and this box so anyway most of our uh, submittals are now coming in online um, so yeah, that we don't really have the option to sit down and help. Yeah, uh, we are we are open for am I, public am, appointments. Am I correct? I maybe that's just with public works, but they told me only contractors could submit online. That owner builders had to. That's, so that's a building. That's a building division oh, that's thing. A, okay. And I, I, I won't answer to that. Yeah. I, won't, I won't speak to that. Yeah. That doesn't. It doesn't make sense. I'm almost sure we've gotten building permits from owner builder, but I'm not positive yeah. about that. I do know that the option right now is submit in person, submit electronically. Yeah. Uh, it's. Yeah. But uh, I think if we can plan towards the. Uh, worst case scenario of somebody who's never done any of this before and is lost in the woods and looking for help and they, they stumble into the planning department and okay, they help. take it from there. Yeah. Okay, help. 
Anything else? For I was wondering if we're going to return to that uh, homeowner versus non-homeowner <laughs> fee schedule. Um, return to that. Yeah. Slide. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can. Chris, I mean, I, yeah. No. Just as far as what, if a homeowner is looking at that, I think it potentially could be interpreted as if I hire a contractor, now my fee goes up by three times or whatever it was. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but it looks significantly more expensive. Maybe is that true or is that? Define owner versus non-owner. How, how would um, I think it, the it, planning it, staff determine if this is a um, an owner well, an, application or a non-owner? If, if a contractor submit, submits on behalf of a homeowner, mm -hmm. they're going to get the homeowner fees. Okay. okay. So what, what it's intended for, the intent yeah. of that is really to capture those single family residential or the residential units, if somebody, um, I think even if somebody lives in a, on a duplex lot, if they live there, if it's an income property for them, it, then it's no longer, I, it, then because it's a business, right? Okay. okay. Okay, so that's when the higher fee. So this is if a... It's your, if it's your home, and, and yeah, if, it, if it's your home and you're doing it, it's that's when the fees are. Now, th this is not the first time that this question has come up, and I think that next time we do our our, um, our, our um, fee schedule update, which happens to be coming up January 1st, and maybe I can intercept it, but um, we could do a, probably a better job of clarifying where that break is. Um, I, ultimately, I'd love to, you know, once we get the direction from the board, um, your requests or suggestions, um, we may, we're at, a, we're at a really good time with a fee schedule revamping coming up next year that we may be able to incorporate some of these changes. I think it's I I think there's a very strong argument to eliminate the fees for homeowners, whether it's going to get support or not. I yeah. I you know I, well, like I don't know. if the board wants, I mean that's <laughs> all we can do with that. But I will say this that in 2023, if we eliminated the fees associated with major, minor, and um, the um, going the cost of going for the cultural heritage board, which isn't up there. Oh, is it up there? Neighborhood meeting. No, I. Um, oh. mm -mm. The city would have lost zero dollars because there were no applications in two thousand twenty-three. We didn't see. They were done now. Any, they were done on Sundays. So um, there's there's sometimes a situation where um, if you want to accomplish a goal, you know, I the the through the neighborhood outreaches, if they knew there were no fees involved, I think you would get greater compliance. Um, and. Especially if they get red tape, you know, then it costs you even more. Yeah, and at, at the same time, if there's no fees involved, it's not a huge loss for the city. It really isn't for residential. If you, all you targeted was residential, it really isn't much, much money loss. And the goodwill, mm -hmm. I think, good. that, it, that, that it would put out towards making it achieving that general plan goal of making it easier for people. Um, anyway. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that there are two issues with the process and it's both money and time. So if, um, if the board would consider a similar process to the reviews, reduce review authority process um, where they're relinquishing control to the zoning administrator, um, that is something that is going to cut probably for yeah, I'll say three to six months off the review process yeah. for the homeowner. So they can come in, they can be working on their project plans, come in for concept, still working on their project plans, and as soon as they hear board member comments, make whatever minor revisions they need to, and and go uh, submit their application. Yeah, the only, boy, I, I, and believe me, I, I love that idea. I'm just wondering for neighborhood noticing, 
you know, as long as we can make sure that um, we don't compromise. We have noticing requirements for concept for for concept for minor design review yeah. and for major design review. It's identical. Yeah. It's property owners and occupants within 600 feet of the site. Yeah, we send them out. And we mail them. I we do not funny. leave them. We don't leave it, it up yeah. to. And, and I don't see why uh, the project that we saw that is is um, actually repairing damage to the historic building, um, why that can't be approved over the counter with appropriate materials that we could list uh, neighborhood by, you know, district by district um, and leave off brick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's appropriate to the house um, the way it would have been done originally, and if we don't have photos. So I had a, a um, conversation with some coworkers and said, if I forget to mention the over the counter landmark alteration, text me. So thank you for bringing that up. There, There is an option, we don't have it right now, to add. Um, that would be a real good recommendation. Um, the over-the-counter landmark alteration, we, you know, maybe there's a fee associated, maybe there's not. There is an over-the-counter design review process with a small fee. It's a, like $243, I think. Um, but would but, that be but, that come to CHB for a concept? Yeah, they can't Well, come Windows are example of that. Windows are example of that, but Windows are exempt. They're listed as exemptions in the, oh, okay. in the um, landmark alteration permit process. Mm -hmm. So Windows and Doors designed to match the original. It is not replaced like for like. Right. Okay, if you're in an older home, you're, you, in the 1920s, they didn't have vinyl windows, at least not that I'm aware of. And so if you have broken down vinyl windows and want to replace them with vinyl windows, you get to come to, or you get to go through a landmark alteration process, okay. depending on where the windows are located. If you propose to put in wood windows, you can get them over, you can get approval over the counter. That's a huge difference in pricing, but it's also a huge time savings, and that that's what I, that's where I say you know time savings. I would not, I personally would not be supportive of an over-the-counter design review for the front of a building that didn't go through concept design process and match identically what the board suggested. I would not be comfortable with that because it would put staff in an, an awkward situation. But con they could take from concept review, it seems to me, and go directly and, and move on directly to permit in most cases. It doesn't now. No. Uh -huh. No, there's a process that follows the concept yeah. review because there's no formal determination. There's no resolution with concept. Um, so Could we change that, though? Not with concept. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a decision making um, event. Okay, it's it's directive. But but we are talking about the possibility of the comments that come from concept being able to just go to the zoning administrator. That is a public meeting that has a resolution. So that's yeah. I, it's a good it's I that's we would, have would a language, tried and true process right now. And would, would language have to be developed to do that or somewhere in the zoning code or something? Or something? Yeah, it would be in the zoning code. Okay. Um but you know it's uh yeah, we've got the measures in the, the general plan yeah. that would support the change. Um, it's just, it's, it's money, it's staff time. Yeah. So, well, in the end, getting, should, if you didn't have to do a major landmark alteration, have all that staff it, time. Well, really also, if there time. were a disaster, you could, move, you could move forward faster in yeah. replacing the building. Using the same process yeah. for disasters don't, and... Don't go down that rabbit hole. Right well, now. <laughs> it's uh, using the same process. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah it, it's going to get, it's going to be a process like that, you know, depending again, is it yeah. one house? Because one house can have a disaster in 300 or in our case, 3,000. You know? that's, that's something that'll be coming back to us. Yeah, in the future. you'll see that soon. Yeah. I also would really like to see us try to eliminate the historical survey for most homes. And I mean, no one needs to know that, you know, Carol Smith saved $2,300 in 1915 and went to Sears and Roebuck and bought a kit house. You know, I mean, that 
it doesn't need to be no and most that house like known as that house from here on out you know i mean if you're a if if you are a uh you know a, a, in a in a dis, in a district and you are a contributing home even i mean even if you're tiny and there are lots of homes like that. Why do you need that? You yeah. need it on a major architectural. Absolutely. Or a demolition. Yeah. Yeah. You need but a, or a, a major, historical report. A major property yeah. in that historic district. And everybody knows what they are, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We've seen some of those reports, you know, that have been done that have been kind of way over and above. Yes. So, like the, so part of the concept review process you can direct them on what's necessary yeah. mm -hmm. so that when they go to their their um, consultant they can say this is what i've been told to get and not to worry about this you know that that's that's one of the benefits of concept and we really do try to push concept mm -hmm. so the yeah we we do and, and my re research and doing putting this program together it just was glaring to me that concept concept is, yeah. the review yeah. is is yeah. our real yeah. And I think is if I have neighbors that come to me and ask about things, that's going to be the number one thing that I tell them is I say, you really need to come in, mm -hmm. you know, talk, agree, talk to the planning agree. staff and, and plan to do a concept mm -hmm. review. In the long run, they'll save time. And the other key is tell them to work with the same plan that they start with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So other, other thoughts? If I could just add one more comment to this fee schedule, I will say that we know that rental units exist in these districts to charge them of land on lower $1,600 for something that's not charged at all for concept review. And we're in the broader discussion here, we're talking about why people aren't coming in front of the board. It seems a little bit dissuasive for them to come in and get a discussion for almost $2,000. That yeah. seems a little tough to me. So potentially eliminate concept review costs across the board. Or how about change it or to it or something. the type of property, not who owns it, not what it's used for. Mm. So so along with sure. similar to the yeah. so if it's a single, if it's a you know a lot mm. that's less than X number, or a house that, or a structure that's less than X square feet, or and um, I think if you've got a 10 unit apartment building and you live in one of the units, I don't think it's the same you thing. Know, you wouldn't get, I, it, it, wouldn't wouldn't apply. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't apply. It wouldn't there, apply. Right? Yeah. No, so this is intended for single family, family residential. residential, and then we have that, that missing middle housing that mm -hmm. we find in a lot of historic houses mm -hmm. where they were big and they were modified into, mm -hmm. you know, one, two, three, four units, and right. they are all over. Right. I was, I was amazed when I went on a tour with some coworkers one day and how many and where they are, you know, in all the districts. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. But um, but those those would get that, in my opinion, that free concept review was intended for all of those structures mm -hmm. that were maybe originally constructed as single family. And, and keep in mind, and we haven't some we haven't been through the process yet, but if it's a uh, large commercial structure. Um, we'll do concept review with the design review board jointly, and it's usually a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's Caracas Village or that apartment complex on B Street that we had, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a it's a big deal for staff and a big. So I could see maybe a, a project of that scale having a fee, and uh, again looking at just a smaller scale residential, you know, mm -hmm. trying to eliminate those fees. Because there's also situations where family members live in houses that don't necessarily own them, et cetera, et right, cetera. Right. So. I, I really don't. I think the owner is applicant, non-owner is very confusing. It, it's yeah, I, I got no okay. self over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm hearing you. <laughs> um, I find this stormwater determination worksheet odd as well. So it's real easy to get right through that when it you is. hit, hit yeah. the first no, and, you're done. and then you like yeah. skip forward. That is a storm. It just seems I can't. It's hard to picture the ten thousand square foot residential unit that would be cooking yet. Oh, you know. they're there. Trust are they? me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think we argue about. Oh, I'm talking. Oh, I'm not talking like. I'm talking like single family. Uh, they're there. They're there. Really? They're there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On and yes. <laughs> most of those lots aren't even. No, not not feet. down in the, not in 
not in the preservation districts mm -hmm. like Burbank Gardens and what have you, but there are some, mm -hmm. I'd say over in McDonald district, yeah, they've got some ones. large lots. Yeah. Well, and there's some on B Street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I have to admit, some I mean, part of my strategy was to give the overwhelm effect of all this paper that when you walk in mm -hmm. and, and you know, and you just start getting hit with well, all of this. As especially a, if it's a, a little thing you're doing, you know? Yeah. I mean, if it's a major something. Yeah. yeah. So again, these are things just to kind of, kind of soak in and, um, and decide whether we want to, at the end of this discussion, move forward with this with some recommendations and and uh, the recommendations can come in the form of recommendations to staff and they come and actually could come in the form of uh, resolution to the uh, city council which i believe would probably be required if we wanted to eliminate fees mm -hmm. or reduce fees. recommendation so, from the cultural heritage board but we're not looking for that those decisions today today is just for you to just take this in Take the information in and then come back if if you choose. I don't want this to be my deal. I want this to be the, the board deal. So and how I, does that happen? Do we have another special meeting or do we do it at a regular meeting that we make? It'd be another right it'd be at a we'd agendize at a at another regular meeting. And that would be for coming up with our list of recommendations. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Well let's get there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that I the only thing about the historic um, what do you call them? Those no, reports is that the city hasn't had the funds to hire someone to get that information in a lot of districts, and so that that's why that is there now. Um, because, the requirement for the report because it gives the information that is needed for. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> for the historic district oh um it it tells us it tells us what it has a qualified professional right we look to that report staff looks to that report right for a qualified professional to say this these changes are not going to have a negative impact on the historic value of this home uh, character defining elements of this home or the structure or its neighbors or the so district as a whole. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's that's why the, because and that's we're not tough too because some of them are better qualified than others to mm -hmm. write those reports. That's true. I mean, but there are some that I would throw out. It's just it's generally <laughs> it's generally just a justification report for something right. that the owner yeah. wants right. to do. I mean, it's usually written in favor of doing what you want to do and to me the most important of those reports is when you're talking about demolition or a large portion of the structure being uh, eliminated so, um, to really know what it's going to mean to not have that anymore to not have that structure anymore what was the significance of that structure mm -hmm. that's probably to me the the extreme end of it mm -hmm. For this case, did they need to spend the money for? Pro probably not, because that's there's thousands of those little houses, bungalows. But unless something significantly happened there, and Lincoln was shot on the front porch or something, you know. So. But staff isn't or a congressman. Like <laughs> yeah. Staff isn't qualified to make that right. Like the comment on the review criteria there, so. In absence of the report, we would depend on the comments made by the staff, the, the cultural heritage board during concept review saying it doesn't need this because we are making this determination. And we can do that. And you can do that. And we can require it where it needs it. Yes. At, at concept. Yeah. Okay. So, but they've got to get to concept for you to do that. Yes, you so can. So, could there We're, be a requirement that all projects come to concept? Unless they can be approved over the counter, come to concept. No, we can make the recommendation for it, and and uh, I should say, in some cases, yes. In that re reduced review authority scenario, mm -hmm. they are required to go to concept. Mm -hmm. The the qualified experts have to look at it, have to have eyes on and comment on it in order for it to go to the design the project to go to the design review board. 
I'm, I'm sorry, to the zoning sorry. administrator. Okay. Likewise here, what would that look like? Somebody wants to do a facade update, change, addition, whatever. Uh, they come, they require a major landmark alteration permit. An alternative to that is reduced review authority where they come to the Cultural Heritage Board with their plans. Now, that those are plans that are pretty well set. Right. And so you can see what it's going to look like. You know what materials they're proposing. And they then the board directs. Okay. The, the board has no decision authority there. They just are giving guidance. They're giving right. direction. Then those comments get bundled together with whatever the final submittal is, and it gets reviewed by staff, and it goes to the zoning administrator, and the zoning administrator says, well, okay, I understand that the board wanted this type of window, but this type of window really looks very similar, I, and it saves them, um, you know, $10,000. I mean, we've seen that kind of difference on windows, right? Um, and they and the zoning administrator makes the decision to approve it based on the windows proposed, not the ones that the cultural heritage board suggested that they are directed that they uh, use. <laughs> so, so I, the, the, again, it's it's relinquishing control. At the same time, a board member from the cultural heritage board can be invited to those meetings, right? And they can help advise but they do not have any decision-making capacity at that meeting. That is the zoning administrators, the, the zoning administrators, the review authority in that scenario. And I, again, you can watch, watch some of the videos from the reduced review authority. You know, we, we twist and tangle and try to get to yes, but, um, but I, I didn't always take, I didn't always implement what the design review board was asking for that member um, because it was in an area of the building that it's a brand new building, you know, whatever the reason, regardless of the reason, it, you know, you're there and um, yeah, something can happen that you may not agree with, but it's one structure and these are a lot of small structures. Most of the time they're going through a process like this. It is an improvement. It may not be the best improvement, but it's an improvement. So, so I had a question. It seemed to me like a number of years ago that we were approving, instead of having it be an all wood window on the front of homes, that we were allowing it was a fiberglass composite wood, composite wood mm -hmm. that we were allowing wood that, clad. Wood, I mean, it was uh, fiberglass clad. Fiberglass mm -hmm. clad. That we fiberglass were, clad and aluminum clad. I think we're both. We approved. were that we were allowing mm -hmm. that. Like that would be something that I would be open for you we, know we approve those over the counter now because oh. of the precedent set by the cultural heritage board okay yeah we will also side that. size of the window doesn't change mm -hmm. size the material lights uh, try to try yeah. to mimic the lights that were mm -hmm. original and there. also the configuration yeah. 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 yeah the configuration location size and material we can approve those over the counter that's wonderful the questions, comments. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm basically looking for a, a motion as to uh, if the board would like to continue this item for the purpose of coming back with recommendations for changes uh, in the current process, just as a broad, you know the whole process so what it would mean at our next session and um, what I would probably do is work with Ms. Murray is probably come up with some draft uh, recommendations for the board to consider but it would also be an opportunity for you to bring to the board your recommendations for us to consider and then potentially at the end of that meeting um, actually take take some action now whether that action will be followed through or not you know in time, I mean, nothing, it, but, nothing moves quickly. But, uh, but you know, uh, for the sake of not being timely follow through doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't take action anyway. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so anyway, and, or we may want to take no action. It again, it's it's, it's uh, and I, I would hope that when we get to that point, we have a full board because it would be nice to mm -hmm. to really have everybody's opinion and everybody's feeling. I would like to make a motion that we continue this item um, to a date uncertain. 
yeah. um, and and that we in twenty four <laughs> in twenty twenty four, and that we uh, you know consider all options. Mm -hmm. And also well, propose some <laughs> options. <laughs> propose some <laughs> options. <laughs> kind of quick and take a vote. Yeah. Um, so that was a motion by board member Fennell, seconded by Vice Chair Cappy. Um, well, I was supposed to say that, wasn't I? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I had a break for meeting, so I'm all <laughs> over the place. Uh, okay, so a vote. Uh, board member Carney? Aye. Board member Fennell? Aye. Board member Marsland? Aye. Vice Chair Garrett? Aye. Chair Mieser? Aye. Um, so that passes with. Five Aye. eyes and <laughs> two absences. Okay, and with no other, I'll close. Oh, um, and I'll open public comment uh, on this yeah. item. Seeing oh. no members here no, or the public, no, I'll close public, public comment. Yeah. I have a public comment from the public, <laughs> but I was texted to. Um, I yep. can read it after the <laughs> we can read it after the meeting. <laughs> and with no other items on the agenda, I'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank, thank you, you all job. for being here. Thank you, staff. Yes, thank you for being here.